Last week, you learned about the four components of what goes into calculating GDP by the expenditures method, and it was consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. So this time, we're going to look a little more deeply at what determines the levels of consumption, investment, and export spending. We'll save government spending for the next week. So what determines the level of consumption spending? This particular graph is comparing consumption spending to investment. I'm sorry, to income. So if you see the bottom of the graph, I know it's hard to see. Uh, you can't actually see the label on the x-axis. It says disposable income. So this is disposable income here, the amount of money people have after taxes. And this is consumption. And so you can see there's a very high correlation. This data is from 1980 to 2002. There's a very, very strong correlation between income and consumption. Income is what determines consumption. That's what John Maynard Keynes suggested in his analysis of the economy. It doesn't have to do with interest rates. They're not going to impact consumption. It doesn't necessarily have to do with other factors like exchange rates or unemployment rate. It's about income. So if incomes go up, as we can see here, consumption goes up. So this 45 degree reference line, this is called the Keynesian cross diagram. And it's actually not even on the AP test anymore, but it does sometimes still come up in Econ Challenge. So according to the Keynesian cross diagram, uh, consumption is a function of income. Um, and what happens is, as people's incomes go up, as we move to the right here, consumption goes up. But notice that the distance between the two lines also goes up. Well, until we get to here. That's a long story. But generally speaking, people's saving also goes up. So as income goes up, consumption goes up, and saving goes up. So let's look at that in a little more detail in a minute. Um, this is just a general um, look at what people do with their income. And in, I don't know what the year this was, um, 2005. In 2005, out of like $7,304,000,000, uh, people spent 84% of it. So taxes was about 13%, and savings was about 3%. And the rest of their money, 84% of it, they spent on personal consumption expenditures. Okay, so this table is really helpful to help us see what's going on. It looks a little bit complicated at first, but it's really not very complicated. So the first column is simply income. And what they're saying here is that GDP equals disposable income. So we're assuming uh, a closed private economy. There is no government. There is no taxation. Um, everything that's produced becomes income to somebody. So these are varying levels of income, and these are varying levels of consumption that correspond to the income. So when people's incomes are very low at here, say, $370 billion, people are actually spending more than they earn because they're borrowing or they're spending down their savings, right? Maybe they're running up debt on credit cards. So those are a few possibilities. So at this level of income, savings is actually negative. We call that dis-saving. But if incomes go up, as we saw on the, on the table with actual data, um, or on the graph, we can see that consumption goes up, but also saving goes up, right? We have more money, we have more money in the pie, and so people spend more and they also save more, or they break even. At this level of income, 410, consumption again goes up, and savings becomes a positive number. So all the way along, as people's incomes increase, so does their level of consumption, and so does their amount of savings. So that's all the first three columns are. And then the next columns are basically uh, calculating based on the initial data in the first three columns. So this first one is average propensity to consume. And that, what we're looking at is overall, what percentage of your income are you spending? So it's just column two divided by column one. Here people are spending more than 100% of their income, 375 divided by 370. Here it's a break even, 390 divided by 390. Right? And as people's incomes go up, look what happens to their average propensity to consume. It goes down. So they're spending more dollars, but they're spending a lower percentage of their income. Why? Because they're starting to save more. So the next column, column five, is the APS, or the average propensity to save. So here we're just taking column three and divided by column one. And when people's incomes were very low, the average propensity to save was negative 0.01. As we move along, people start to save more, and the percentage of income that is saved actually increases. So in real terms, in dollar terms, as people's incomes increase, they spend more and they save more. But in percentage terms, as people's incomes increase, they consume a lower percentage and they save a higher percentage. Why? Basically because they can. 
right? Because when you're wealthier, you can actually afford to save. When you're barely earning enough to pay rent and pay for food, you don't save very much. All right, the last two columns are the really important ones here. And those are the ones that are um, the marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to save. As always, economists are interested in what's marginal, meaning they're interested in what would you do with one more unit. And these last two columns tell us, predictively, if you had one more dollar, right, what would you do with it? And the way this is calculated is we look at the change, right, the change in consumption over the change in income. So when we move from, from row one to row two, consumption changes by 15, income changes by 20, right? When we move from two to three, again, consumption changes by 15, income changes by 20. So 15 divided by 20 gives us a constant marginal propensity to consume 75%. The marginal propensity to save predicts for us, what would you do if you earned one more dollar? What percentage would you save? So we take the change in savings, which is five every time, over the change in income, which is 20 at each point. So the MPC and MPS are going to be really important because they're going to, we, we could then fill in the whole rest of the table, right? We could fill it in up to an output level of, you know, a trillion. Right, we could just keep using the MPC and MPS, and they would dictate what happens to consumption and what happens to savings. So look at this table for a minute, okay, and see if you can fill in the data. What are APC, APS, MPC, MPS? You should pause to do this. Okay, here's the answer. So check your work, and if you're not sure, right, ask someone when you come to our next session. Remember, these last two columns are going to be constant because you're going to be calculating the change in consumption or the change in savings or the change in income. The MPC helps us calculate something called the spending multiplier. I'm going to move this information up a little bit. The spending multiplier is used to predict what would happen if there was an increase in autonomous spending. In other words, somebody from somewhere injects money into an economy. What's going to be the overall change in GDP? So imagine a closed private economy, right, with a particular GDP, and all of a sudden, somebody comes from wherever, right, they come from a different country, or they come from outer space or wherever, and they just spend $5 in that economy. So that $5 right away becomes income to someone. We know that the first person who receives it is going to spend a proportion of it, right, whatever the marginal propensity to consume is. So if the marginal propensity to consume is 0.75, they're going to spend 75% of it. So that person spends $3.75, and that becomes income to someone else. And that person spends 75% of it, and that becomes income to someone else. And it goes on and on and on and on. And we're not, we didn't put all the calculations in here, but what happens is, ultimately, income is changed by $20. So an initial spending of $5 causes an increased GDP of 20. And of course, we're talking about billions here. Um, it also causes an increase in consumption and an increase in saving. What we're concerned about is this. What happens to GDP? Spending of $5 causes $20 change in GDP. That's four times the initial increase. That's, that four is what we call the multiplier. Okay, the multiplier effect is the fact that because people spend what they receive in income and that money gets spent over and over again, any initial change is going to have a larger impact on GDP. And we can calculate it by taking the initial investment times the multiplier. How do we find the multiplier? The multiplier is actually going to be 1 over the value of the MPS. Okay, I guess I, I thought I had another slide on that. So 1 over the MPS, in this case MPS is 0.25, 1 over 0.25 is 4, and that is going to be the value of the multiplier. So there's a few multipliers that you're going to want to know. <clears throat> if, for example, the MPS is 0.1, the multiplier will be 10. If the, multi if the MPS is 0.5, the multiplier will be 2. So you just want to familiarize yourself with a few of those numbers. All right, we're going to go back to this Keynesian, what's called the aggregate expenditures model. Um, this plots, okay, in a stylized model instead of actual data. Okay, this is what, what we had from our table. So you can see that there's this break-even point, right, where people are spending every dollar that they earn. That would be equilibrium for this economy. And this line tells us what happens to consumption as income increases. So a variety of things can actually shift that consumption line and cause a new break-even point. One of the things is if there's investment in the economy, because right now we've only been talking about consumption. 
So if there's a certain amount, like $20 billion worth of investment, that will shift this line up. And that rather than calling it the consumption line, we call it consumption plus investment or aggregate expenditures. So that line shifts up, and now we have a new equilibrium. Here you can see it, right? We had an initial equilibrium point here, but when we add an investment, it shifts the line up, and we get a much higher equilibrium point here because of the multiplier, right? $20 billion in additional investment causes $80 billion in additional GDP. So this graph is a nice way of depicting that. All right, here's two questions. Pause, figure out your answer, and then come back and listen. Number one, if the APC is 0.75, right, then if income is 100, say, nope, consumption is 75. If income is 100, consumption is nope, right, consumption is 75. If income is 200, saving is 50, that is correct, right, because people save 25% of their income, 25% of 200 is 50. So that is the correct answer. Second question, according to Keynesian theory, the most important determinant of saving and consumption is level of income. That is C. We have one more question here that's kind of funny. It's giving you disposable income of 1,000, consumption of 700, and saying, oh, the MPC is 0.6. Right? So we know the MPS must be 0.4. Income increases by 100. What happens? Well, if you look at this, only one of these answers even has a higher number. If income increases, certainly consumption is going to be higher than 700. And it is. It's going to be 0.6 times 100 higher or $60 higher. Investment spending is different. It is not determined by people's level of income. It is an inverse relationship to the interest rate or the expected rate of return. So if you look at it from the perspective of a business, they're going to be looking at rate of return they're going to be looking at how much can we earn off of an investment. So if we buy a new computer system, how much is that going to improve profits, right? Probably about 2%, right? If we build a whole new factory, what's that going to do to profits? Maybe increase it by 8%. So what this table is saying is how many investments are there out there that would give us this rate of return? And there are a lot of investments that would give us no return, right? And slightly fewer that would give us 2%. You get up to like 14 16% rate of return. There's almost nothing a business can do that would improve their profits by that much. So when a business makes a decision whether to invest or not, what they are doing is they are comparing the expected rate of return to the current interest rate. And if the current interest rate is 2%, they're going to say, wow, there's a lot of stuff we could do that would make that worthwhile, right? So investment's going to be very large. But if the interest rate is 12%, well, it's not worth borrowing money at 12% to invest in something that's only going to give you a very small return. So there are very few things that are worth spend borrowing at 12% to invest in. So the investment demand curve is going to be inverse to the interest rate. There are things that can shift this investment demand curve, so it's possible for there to be more investments at a constant interest rate or fewer investments at a constant interest rate. Those would be things like the cost of actually buying equipment. So if computers get cheaper, then more people are going to be willing to buy them even at a 10% interest rate. There can be tax incentives, right? The government can give people tax breaks for investing in new capital. A new technology could be introduced. When, when smartphones were first introduced, a whole lot of businesses went out and bought them, even at whatever the prevailing interest rate was. And also market expectations. If you think that a recession is coming, even if interest rates are low, you're not very likely to invest. But if you expect good times ahead, then you would be very likely to invest. This graph uh, very simply just shows the relationship between uh, percentage change in GDP year to year, you can see the years are down here, okay, and investment year to year. And this is a really a chicken and egg issue because when, um, when GDP drops, as you can see right here, right, when GDP falls, investment falls even further. And when GDP rises, investment rises more dramatically. You can really see it in this one, right? It drops and GDP, you know, investment goes way down. And when GDP recovers, investment shoots way up. So it could be that changes in investment are actually driving the changes in GDP, or it could be that the investors are looking at what's happening in the GDP and making their decisions accordingly. Okay, we only have 30 more seconds in this, so what determines the level of net export spending? There isn't a very simple formula for this. Ultimately, and we'll talk more about this later, um, it's exchange rates are the biggest thing. Exchange rates and political stability. So if a, a currency, for example, if Canada's currency is cheaper, that will increase their exports. But if their currency gets more expensive, their exports will decrease.